Is this working? Yes, now it's working. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Uh, we're ready to resume. Welcome back from the coffee break, those of you who are here, and welcome to those of you who are tuning in, uh, if that's the proper verb for it, uh, online uh, at the moment. I think I just dated myself. Um, the uh, next in the program, uh, as you know, science business uh, has um, frequent, uh, nearly 30 events a year, large and small, specialized in general, uh, and the health sector is an extremely important one for our network and what we do. And in the in that regard, um, uh, the. Uh, we had a, uh, uh, earlier this year, we had a dinner with members and guests on uh, the subject of health innovation and policy generally, and here to talk about that and the general conclusions from this and suggestions for a health agenda for the new commission, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, one of our members. Uh, uh, it's uh, Dominika Saretska Tunsar. She is Senior Vice President and Head of External Affairs in Europe for Sanofi. So thank you very much for joining us. Go ahead. Is the speaker on? Yes. Yes, okay. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is okay. a privilege to be part of a room filled with such important thought leaders in research and health in Europe from both public and private sectors. And it is also a pleasure to exchange with decision makers. Your presence today speaks volumes about European science and policy excellence. It also demonstrates one of the most tangible, if underestimated, unfortunately, benefits of the European structure and namely the diversity and the pool of talent um, from many European countries that ultimately Europe brings together. And uh, I'm myself an example, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, born in Poland, living in London, working in Paris. We'll see how long uh, that will be easy to do. I would like to thank Science Business uh, for giving us the opportunity to contribute to this discussion, to facilitate exchange, and to debate in order to ultimately build our healthy future together. Indeed, not only today, but as mentioned during the past few months, many stakeholders have been uh, involved and engaged in sharing their ideas and their ambitions to make the European Union a world leader in health. And I am proud today to take the floor and present to you the recommendations of this group aimed at creating the new health agenda in Europe. Like all of you, I'm sure, I carry a sense of urgency, and it's not just one rooted in the um, health statistics, but also in the personal stories and my own family stories. Um, with a father-in-law who lives with diabetes and its consequences, with a mother-in-law who unfortunately lost her long and brave battle with cancer, and my own personal struggles with autoimmune disease. Thankfully, Europe has a long history of the health sector and has developed a very strong foundation on which we can all build. The European Union has demonstrated its long-term commitment for health research, notably the already mentioned cutting-edge Innovative Medicines Initiative program, which is, by the way, the world's leading, biggest public-private partnership in life sciences. So something we can all be proud of, at least uh, the Europeans. Sanofi is proud to be part of the IMI program and has uh, been part of 88 projects since its very inception in 2008 and has led or co-led 28 of them. And I hope you agree that IMI has brought uh, tremendous added value to the research and to health overall in Europe. And thinking again of my own family health struggles, I recall the diabetes project which is called Emedia, and has led to the world's first validated human beta cell line, which actually unlocked one of the key bottlenecks in diabetes research. I also think about the IMI's another program called Cancer ID Project, which has validated a series of tests 
for cancer cells to help develop more effective diagnostics and more personalized treatments and ultimately um, to help advance care in specifically lung and breast cancer. Reflecting on more recent examples, I think of the FluCOP, the project aiming to deliver a standardized toolbox to evaluate the ability of a vaccine, of a new vaccine, to stimulate the immune system. Europe beats the rest of the world in uh, life expectancy and continues to pull, even though we've heard of the divergent uh, approaches and results uh, in the previous session, and continues to pull research looking to reduce the early deaths from cardiovascular disease, from cancer, diabetes, chronic respiratory uh, diseases by 1.5% by 2020, and we're on target, we're on schedule to deliver that. The pharmaceutical sector is a key asset for the European economy. It employs 150,000 uh, people in research and development alone and 750,000 people in total. Companies based in the EU produce almost 80% of the world's vaccines. Our sector is also is considered a high-tech, part of the high-tech sector, contributing the most to the EU trade balance, delivering trade surplus of almost 80 billion in 2017, and that's euros. However, many challenges remain ahead of us, and we've talked about some of them, and uh, it's clear that additional efforts are needed in order to make progress further. The rising incidence of chronic diseases and um, coupled with the aging population, I'm sure you all know, is putting unprecedented pressures on healthcare systems. And there is the looming threat, of course, of the antimicrobial resistance, as well as the recent alarming recurrence of measles um, on the continent in the wake of the anti-vaccination campaigns. At the same time, we're witnessing unprecedented and huge transformation for the, in the health industry. Entirely new fields of inquiry have emerged, such as genetics, bioengineering, and the scale of data that's available to researchers is unprecedented and very different from the past. We're now counting in zettabytes, and that's 21 zeros uh, for anyone interested. During the same time, we've gained a, a considerable amount of knowledge about the basic biology and the inner workings of the human body. The combination of technology and biology, powered by data and analytics, is defining the healthcare of tomorrow. And this health of tomorrow is already burgeoning um, in the research um, projects of today that many of you are leading. And Europe needs to remain a leading uh, uh, global uh, competitive, uh, strong innovation uh, ecosystem in order to continue to attract research and development. To stay competitive in this complexity, to continue to innovate and deliver answers for patients every day, because ultimately that's why we're all here, solutions need to be developed in cooperation with member states and in partnerships with public and private actors. That's why in partnership with Science Business, a multi-stakeholder roundtable or dinner, um, discussed on what should be a future agenda for health in Europe, from research all the way to patients. Participants included really the diversity of, of the room here today, and um, so namely European Commission, academia, institutions, foundations, the industry, the trade associations, representatives from IMI, uh, and all working together on a roadmap for a new health agenda in Europe. With all the diversity of the profiles around the table, it's reassuring to know that we have a shared common ambition and that is making Europe a world leader in medical research and development in order to protect the health of its people and Europe's place on the global stage. And the roadmap is a summary of the discussion and specifically contains nine recommendations. I'm going to just give a highlights of them. First, together we need to develop a dynamic health research and development ecosystem which will thri thrive and benefit from the diverse actors including a mi mix of s small and medium enterprises, startups, multinationals, as well as alliances with non-pharma uh, industrial actors such as digital and IT companies. Next, we need to strengthen and, uh, the network of scientists and academics 
national and European public-private partnerships and Europe's ability to retain and grow talent. We need to maximize the cooperation of health between all the different funding programs and ensure there's a clear pipeline running from basic to translational research. Encourage collaboration across countries, and we've talked about that, and secure investment in important areas of growth, such as, again, digital infrastructure and health data capabilities. We also need to develop a high quality regulatory framework, one that is evolving to keep pace with the technology and, and science and with the increasing utilization of intellig artificial intelligence in big data so it can cope in order for research to foster medical innovation. We need to enable a seamless health data space. Digital and technology literally disrupt every step of the healthcare's value chain, whether we talk about research, clinical trials, of empower or empowering patients. Seizing the potential of digital and technology in healthcare for patients is only possible with a strong and long-term political commitment and structural investments to, to build a digital infrastructure and to make the IT health system interoperable, and I think we've heard that word today, for maximizing the potential of health data. The European Union can help uh, health data travels safely and seamlessly and in parallel all stakeholders from the health system must team up to build the conditions of trust around the use of such data. That includes agreeing on methods and protocols for use, defining standards for measuring patient relevant health outcomes, ensuring clarity toward patients on privacy. That's why the roadmap proposes to co-build an agenda to help hospitals move forward in the digital world and draw up a fresh strategy to train the new generation of digital doctors. Better coordination is needed, but also more investment to help hospitals and smaller companies catch up. According to 2016 report from World Health Organization, the lack of funding is one of the most significant barriers to digital health. The European Union should contribute, should continue its efforts to build a single market for development stage companies. Expanding the range of financing options in Europe would benefit businesses seeking capital for expansion, especially small and medium sized enterprises, and address Europe's over reliance on banking, bank lending. To be efficient, it is crucial to measure results in short, mid, and long term. We need an access environment in Europe based on evidence of outcomes. Improved econo economic modeling is needed to demonstrate the value of health innovation. In tandem, member states, highly regulated pricing should take into account outcomes rather than purely budget impact. Unfortunately, new treatments and approaches for diagnosing diseases struggle to get picked up by the health systems in Europe. One participant to the uh, roundtable stressed that we're awfully good at pushing technology, but not good at articulating the value of, to health systems. He's totally right. To improve, we have to work together to define a common language and avoid that the short-term analysis should be more important than the measurement of long-term outcomes. In this regard, one of the recommendations uh, of the roadmap asked to fo foster a common European pathway to accelerate and improve the drug approval process. Currently, a legislative proposal on health technology assessment is being discussed and it was mentioned today. This is an important proposal which will add real value through a European framework and pooling of capabilities and expertise for joint clinical assessments and early uh, scientific dialogue at European level. We need to improve and accelerate the way in which we provide patient access to innovative medicines or vaccines in Europe. One of the key words in coordination is the coordination. That's why it is crucial that member states' efforts should be made to facilitate EU actions and vice versa. Moreover, in our context, we need to embrace a holistic approach if we want to be more efficient. To strengthen the efficiency, there's another important word, and that's dialogue. Today and tomorrow, we need to keep discussing around the table with private and public stakeholders in order to identify synergies and to find adaptive solutions together and implement them. Dialogue is key and communication is also an important part of our recommendations.
Thus, we call to increase preventative awareness campaigns, such as the tobacco con control, which has proven very successful, but also to boost vaccination programs for preventable diseases. Vaccination coverage is key to protect citizens. It is worrying to hear of all diseases, such as measles, are on the rise. A new public health campaign by the European Union is one way to tackle vaccine hesitancy. As one of the roundtable participants said, we're living in a world of information. This is a nightmare for patients because you have to distinguish between information and education. I would add, vaccines save lives, not endanger them. And just recently I watched a film about a British public, um, public servant, a civil servant, who contracted polio disease in the early 50s and, and you know, his basically life expectancy was tremendously reduced and he suffered from complete uh, uh, paralysis. And I was thinking, we don't hear about polio anymore and that's something to be thankful, I guess, for. Another recommendation proposes benchmarking and facilitating the communication of what works for health at member state level. There are many successful examples and we just need to share them and rec replicate them. And here, one of the par participants commented, we need to think of upscaling all the successful examples in our regions rather than reinventing the wheel all the time. Finally, I would also like to add that Europe is not alone but operates on a global stage and it is key for Europe to secure a competitive level playing field. That means removing trade barriers and red tape in third countries and ensuring fair access to international markets. The roadmap sets out proposals for all of us to foster European medical research, ease patient access and advance health innovation in Europe. These are by no means complete. What matters is that they are a result of a dialogue. We encourage decision makers to organize forums, discussions, further roundtables to continue the debate and make common effort to succeed in the implementation of these recommendations. As such, we call for a strong, integrated and co-created policy for health, avoiding any overlaps. Ladies and gentlemen, we are standing today at one of the most exciting junctures. We have an opportunity to create our future. A new European Parliament and a new Commission are an opportunity for all of us to build on, build on previous successes while pushing further our ambition, especially with the stand is starting mandate. And the new President-elect of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has written, I am passionate about health, and so am I, and I'm sure you too. And I hope the new Commissioner for Health is too. That's why I am more confident than ever that together we are creating one of the most exciting health innovation systems in the world. Whether we talk about research and development, industrial production or the digital transformation of healthcare, I am convinced that one of the keys to success will be our ability to build the right partnerships and move together as a community. All your talents are needed and I count on all of you. Before concluding, I would like to thank each participant of the roundtable who co-built this roadmap and inform you that the report is available. It's by the registration desk, the coffee networking area, and I hear the report is disappearing quickly, so grab a copy, a copy please. I am now calling on all of us to embed the new health agenda into practice, obviously not overnight, but collectively implementing jointly in our respective areas of expertise to ensure Europe is positioned as a role model and a highly competitive healthcare system globally that continues to deliver best health results for its citizens and patients. Thank you for your attention. Oop. Thank, you very, thank you very much, Dominica. Uh, now, <coughs> uh, Monsieur Paquet, vous êtes arrivé. Okay. Uh, come join me up here, if you will. Uh, you know, I've been a journalist for some 45 years in the U.S. and Europe, uh, and there are some days when it's a delight to be a journalist, when the news is happening. And why is it that every time you and I encounter each other, there's something going on? 
So please have a seat. Uh, I'm delighted, uh, for those of you who don't already know him, uh, Jean-Éric Paquet, he's the Director General for Research and Innovation, or should I say Innovation in Youth? Ah, no, 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 Research and Innovation. <laughs> uh, so we had a very carefully um, developed plan for this, but uh, overtaken by events. Uh, so we will come back to that plan, but first of all, I mean, uh, just on the new, for those of you who have not yet seen it, the announcement from the Commission uh, today, well, from uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, was that there will be uh, Maria Gabriel, the Bulgarian, will be Commissioner for Innovation and Youth. Um, there are a whole list of other very interesting developments, uh, but. In our little world, that's one of the most significant ones. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, and in response to questions also, we're told there's to be a merger of DGRTD and EAC. No, 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 no. No? Ah. No, no, that is... Uh, we no, got it wrong then. You did, you did, you did. Um, indeed, um, President-elect von der Leyen presented today um, her, the lineup and the organization of the next college. So I'm not going to, to, to comment on it um, uh, in any way. I don't think I, I, I should in my, in my role, but I, indeed I'd be happy to clarify some of the, um, some of the uh, elements of her uh, setup. And indeed, Maria Gabrielle is uh, the Commissioner for Innovation and Youth. We got that right. She will work uh, closely with um, Vice President Vestager, uh, who is going to coordinate uh, a broad portfolio around uh, digital in particular. Uh, and, they, and, and Commissioner um, Gabriel will work in that uh, broader context as well. And there will be several services uh, supporting the Commissioner uh, to deliver on her innovation and youth responsibility, of which DG Research and Innovation, uh, but also uh, DG uh, Education and, uh, and Culture. Uh, and also the Joint Research Centre. These are the three services. The JRC as which well. Will, yeah, which will support uh, the Commissioner. So no, no, there is no, no merger of DG Research and Innovation and DG Act, but they both support the same Commissioner. And um, indeed, one of the topics uh, which we have discussed, uh, Richard, and which, uh, which you have covered um, uh, over time is how uh, best uh, the research dimension of European universities can, can be uh, brought together at EU level as it's happening very uh, seamlessly in many member states where these portfolios are connected. Well, this is now um, the case also in the portfolio of uh, Maria Gabriel. So this, I think, would allow uh, Temis and myself to work uh, even more together um, uh, in a joined up way supporting uh, the well, future Well, but as a practical <coughs> matter then, so DGE Act, JRC, and RTD will remain separate entities Okay, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, separate DGs and mm -hmm. the structure. That's how the uh, that's how the annex of setting then up how the services supporting. The then how will this work? Management. Will there be any change in the working relationship among the three DGs? Um, the three DGs will uh, work under the leadership of uh, Commissioner Gabriel, and uh, I'm sure that Commissioner Gabriel will certainly uh, uh, help us to work even uh, better together. But quite frankly, uh, Vlado and Temes and myself, uh, we work together on, an, on a quasi-daily uh, basis. Huh? So yes. the, the, this is the reality today. Uh, but the leadership is, is going to be one leadership, and that certainly will have some implications. Okay, well, positive ones, no doubt. As you can imagine, mm -hmm. as this news came, well, yeah. a large gathering of people, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the corridors and coffee areas have been full of buzzing and gossip and, yeah. and speculation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so one thing that came up, and, and I, I appreciate you can't respond to all of this, but, mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that came up is, okay, so the, then this makes sense for the EIT, that there would be uh, this difficult situation at times mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. relations with RTD would now yep. be simplified. Is yep. that likely to be reflected in yeah, policy? Yeah. Uh, I think, frankly, um, we, we, the, the situation on the ground is, is today, uh, in fact, very good between uh, uh, teams um, uh, working in, on the one hand, uh, uh, of course, in the EIT itself. Uh, in the knowledge and innovation communities, but then also in DGAC, there's a directorate which oversees the EIT. And the preparation of Horizon Europe, where the uh, European Institute for Technology is a key component, uh, together then with the co-creation process in the Commission preparing the rollout of Horizon Europe, 
all this has uh, quite significantly changed the way we are working together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you will, I hope, agree with me that the, the proposal for the European um, Institute of Technology, the new regulation, is obviously completely articulated with uh, Horizon Europe. And there is uh, the framework which is uh, credible to ensure that the output of the EIT uh, in the knowledge and innovation community, the, the thematic output, can um, deeply interact and feed into the strategic planning across uh, other instruments of research and innovation, not only in Horizon Europe, and then support uh, Commission policies and European public policies with solutions, technology, space for social innovation, knowledge and science. This is what European research delivers, EIT as much as many other of the instruments of Horizon Europe and in member states, and this is now already very, very closely articulated in the strategic planning process. In addition to that, uh, I think the, uh, um, the complementarity between uh, the EIC and EIT is now clear in the legal text of Horizon Europe. Yeah. Uh, and also, I think, very clear for the teams. Of course, this still needs to be implemented and there will be a lot of work needed. And so from that point of view, I think it is uh, indeed very positive that there is uh, one uh, commissioner uh, which can uh, lead uh, the work um, and uh, bring this, uh, if possible, even closer together. Okay, so another thing that I've, there has been much buzzing about yeah. and whizzing of statements towards us at Science Business mm -hmm. uh, is the, uh, the absence of the word research yeah. In, the, mm -hmm. in the commissioner's uh, title. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? The, the commissioner's title, um, this came, ac came up um, uh, during uh, the press conference of uh, our president-elect, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, not in relation to innovation and use, in relation to another portfolio, which I now can't remember. And, and, and I think the point she was making is that the portfolio uh, denomination is meant also to be, to be simple and understandable for our citizens. Uh, and this is where innovation and use uh, for her brings across, across a very strong message uh, that Europe is a continent that innovates, and you innovate obviously with research and science, you don't innovate in a vacuum, and that um, uh, our innovation is there also to carry the agenda of our use, obviously supported by use as well. That's, if you want, my reading of the title. But then I think many of you will have um, also looked at the mission letter of uh, Commissioner Gabriel. And when you look at the mission letter, uh, it's very straightforward, huh? research, science, innovation. So the remit of the portfolio of Carlos Moedas today. So, um, so the fears of, of, of some universities and organizations that they, there will be less, I'll be frank, less money, less yeah, emphasis yeah, for, yeah, you, yeah. for research. Not, uh, uh, this should is, not be a worry. This is not uh, in the setup today. This is uh, the, the budget discussion on Horizon Europe is a rather different topic. Huh? I'm sure we'll come to it. Afterwards. Yes. So. Yes. Okay. All right. And the and the last point, uh, just in the in the questions that were arising, mm -hmm. the fact that Commissioner Gabriel is of course from Bulgaria, an EU 13 member. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we are about to enter. Uh, the most significant phase of the whole Horizon discussions, which is the budget. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, is th should we interpret this as good news or uncertain I news? Think, I think you probably should ask her uh, m m more than me, frankly. Uh, but um, uh, behind your question, I think, is indeed very much the debate which took place already between Council, Member States and the Parliament on the widening component of Horizon Europe. Yes. Uh, I mean, just to note, huh, uh, Carlos Moedas in its proposal doubled the budget for widening and Parliament and Council doubled it once again. So we have, uh, in fact, quite a powerful... Uh, well, uh, Parliament wanted even more. Com yeah, 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 that's the yeah. deal which they reached. So we now have a rather uh, powerful component in uh, Horizon Europe. And uh, Commissioner Gabriel will then, will then tell you how she, she intends to, to use it. Okay, all right. So on the... On the, st the uh, I, I'm s oh, actually, I, I lied. There was one other question. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. I'm delighted. This is uh, the, the research and innovation portfolio is uh, obviously constructed in an extremely dynamic way. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to, to work with Commissioner Gabriel. 
um, as a politician much experienced in the Commission and in the European Parliament. I mean, this is going to be a, a great privilege. And I say I'm a privileged person. I worked with Carlos Moedas now over the last two years, and he was a, an outstanding uh, uh, commissioner, leader, and mentor for me. And, and the same will be the case now in the future. So I'm, I'm, I count myself very lucky. Do you expect to still be Director General for Research in three months? Oh, that's what the papers say. I'm Director General <laughs> for Research and Innovation, absolutely. Okay. There, there are all kinds of suggestions about uh, interesting uh, uh, machinations involving uh, L'Elysee, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, etc., mm -hmm, on yeah. Secretary General. Ah, okay. No? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, okay. sir. <laughs> uh, this is <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. So I will stop. I'm DG uh, Director General for Research and Innovation and a, a great team. In DG okay, I, I shall be more polite now. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Uh, uh, the, this is the question, the question of, is coming to strategic planning yeah. of Horizon Europe. Now, you yeah. are in three weeks, two weeks, mm -hmm. uh, going to start a very big conference. So, yes. what are you expecting out of the strategic planning process? Yeah. Um, this is really uh, we. I, what I expect, uh, or what I hope, um, and I think what Carlos Moedas wants, and, and what I will discuss with Commissioner Gabriel, is that the strategic planning can be a real game changer. Uh, the Parliament and uh, the Council, on the basis of our proposal and negotiations uh, between the three institutions, have now agreed an extraordinarily ambitious framework, which is the Horizon Europe uh, regulation, uh, but where, if you want, the real change in the DNA of the programme, uh, and which does not uh, put into question many achievements of the programme which continue, obviously, uh, the European Research Council, Marie Skodowska Curie, obviously also uh, the capacity of the programme to generate critical mass in collaborations across, across Europe, all this is obviously intact. But what comes now uh, on top of it in, in, in Horizon Europe is the, the, the possibility to start working much more ambitiously across policy areas, across sectors in Horizon Europe, across the clusters, to generate these um, technological and social solutions for the climate, environment, economic or social transitions we are confronted with. And this, um, this cross-cutting work is not uh, essentially the way we are traditionally delivering uh, research and exploiting its results um, in member states and, and at EU level. I mean, there are examples of it, obviously, but this is not the traditional way of doing it. As we all know, uh, Horizon 2020 is delivered across specific sub programs which are sectorial and thematic and we are moving beyond that hoping to achieve much more impact but that is uh, I think uh, possible to conceive and I'm again very impressed by the political um, leap of faith of Parliament and Council to have uh, to have enabled that with their agreement but now we need to do it and this is what strategic planning is about how do you effectively do that how do you identify uh, the cross-cutting research which will make a difference uh, in, in energy, but also in transport, and change the equation on climate or biodiversity. This is what um, strategic planning is aimed at helping us to identify, and uh, this therefore requires a, a process of, uh, of a different nature. Well, in the Commission, the famous co-creation process, which has produced the paper which you are familiar with, I'm certainly not claiming that this paper is perfect, uh, far from it, but I think it already now sh shows a rather different direction and creates a much more cross-cutting, much more impactful ambition for specific research elements of it. And now uh, the, con the research and innovation day is in a couple of weeks. Based on the input from this public consultation, we had 5,000 replies, so thank you very much to all of you of which 4,000 largely cover the climate dimension, which is not a surprise. Uh, and these 5,000 replies are now being worked through. We will try to summarize them and make them available at the Research and Innovation Days. And then during these three days, across the program of the event, but also physically at the event itself, during three days, you will have commission and member state teams which will be available for you to discuss that research. What is it that we can do differently, better in Horizon Europe? 
We will bring all of that together and then we will move to the further phase where we will consult again, Richard. I'm saying all of this because um, uh, we were a little bit overwhelmed with the interest for the research and innovation days. Uh, and, well, I don't know where we should have gone, but um, we will be in a very big conference venue. There will be thousands of you attending the Research and Innovation Days. There will be hundreds and maybe thousands which will not be able to attend. I apologize already. We did a big effort to ensure that organizations, no organization is, not, is left outside. But for teams of universities or research organizations which lined up five or ten people, we reduce the list inevitably. So I, I, I sincerely am sorry for that, but I hope that your organizations will find their way to impact on the process at the Research and Innovation Days. A lot will be web streamed uh, beyond the conference as you do it today. And then there will be a further uh, process, obviously, to get the strategic planning right. And when will we see the result of the, you know, the plan? The plan, I think, will uh, emerge in a relatively stable way towards the end of the year. It then, of course, needs to be picked up by Maria Gabriel and by the new commission. Uh, we will, uh, in that phase, also closely discuss with the European Parliament and also with the program committee uh, of uh, member states. And I think the timetable would be an implementing act, which then enacts the strategic planning. Uh, let me say today, at least, uh, for planning purposes, in the first quarter of next year. That's the idea. Okay. Because from there on, we then will need to work again in a very open way on the work programs, allowing then implementation okay. to start in And what about the budget? Well, that's the real question, is the budget, huh? uh, uh, obviously. Just to recap, $94.1 is yeah. the amount in the law that's the proposed. Yeah. Uh, the com Parliament wanted 120, I yes. think, yes. and that compares to 77 in the current program. Yes, so yes. For 28 member states in the present program, yeah. 27 in the new program. So it's a, it's a very, very big component in the uh, MFF proposal of the European Commission. The discussions are ongoing. The expectation is that the European Council uh, will have a first exchange in October. Uh, the Finnish presidency is working hard on that uh, w without this being a public uh, process yet. And then uh, the planning is that at the end of the year, uh, leaders would uh, agree their position, which then obviously needs to be uh, worked through with the European Parliament. Uh, in this context, um, I think it is very clear that uh, the overall uh, MFF is going to be um, a very difficult discussion uh, for member states. Um, the overall amounts proposed by the Commission are challenging for some member states, even if we all know this is a microscopic part of uh, public finances in Europe, it remains uh, politically challenging because it is fair to say that with the United Kingdom not contributing anymore in the budget, the contributions of all member states increase, and in some cases, politically very significantly. Fiscally, I'm not so sure that it's so significant, but politically, I think this is obvious. And this is where there's a lot of pressure on the negotiation. And you know how it works. You've been here before. Uh, after agriculture and regional policy, the next big component is Horizon Europe. Uh, the other big components are the Connecting Europe facility or the Digital Europe program. And if you want this uh, modernized part of the budget, the one which really supports deep added value of EU <coughs> policies, is also the part of the budget which is less obvious to negotiate budgetarily because member states don't really know at the outset what comes back to them. And that's a bit the inherent weakness of these uh, of these parts of the, of the budget in terms of the negotiation. So I think the mobilization, and not for Horizon Europe, frankly, but across that part of the budget of stakeholders is, is very important in this phase. So I would really, I would, I would encourage you not so much to lean on, 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 on Grasa Carvalho or myself. I mean, we are ambitious. Huh? Uh, the question is in member states. This is really where the discussion needs to take place. I, I'm frankly, uh, on the one hand, a, a bit concerned because of this pressure which I see mounting on these components of the budget. I don't think you're discovering anything uh, with me now. But I'm also uh, a little bit optimistic because I think the ambition of uh, the institutions moving now into the future, as expressed in the guidelines of President-elect uh, Frau von der Leyen, the Green Deal, for example, or the digital transformation, 
this is not going to happen out of thin air without resources. And I think the argument for a program like the Digital Europe Program or Horizon Europe, uh, which is the classical argument of the added value of what we are doing and have been doing over time, remains relevant. But I think we need to add to that line of argumentation that these programs are critical to achieve a green deal and accelerate uh, the necessary transition. It's a bit of a different policy line, I know, but one which I think um, leaders need also to hear in the weeks ahead of us, uh, so that the position in the European Council, which is very important, we know that, uh, is, is a good one. So, a long reply, uh, too long a reply, I know. Uh, no, but I will, I will, so that's for the MFF and for the need to really engage um, uh, all of us uh, in, in helping a, a good outcome. And then obviously on the budget, this is uh, the unfinished business in the legal negotiations between Parliament and Council. So no to be the budget distribution in okay. Horizon Europe. Uh, and I think uh, once the overall amount is known, uh, the co-legislator will move in there. I very much hope that the order of magnitude will be uh, the relevant and, and, and equivalent one to what we proposed. And then I hope that the distribution is not going to be too much okay. of a headache, the, huh? but we'll see then. The, the, the last question before I invite the other panelists up to join us is mm -hmm. on the international yeah. side of things. Uh, I, I spent a fair amount of time in Canada this summer mm -hmm. traveling around meeting people and uh, it's pretty clear that in both east and west side of the country uh, there's strong interest in the discussion of association yeah. Yeah. with Horizon Europe. There's also strong interest from Japan. Yeah. There's, and, and you know, there's other countries, basically every country except my own, the US. Uh, I wonder why. Uh, but the, uh, so the, 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 the question is, is it possible? Can, how can this work to bring in these developed countries? Mm -hmm. When do you get to be able to start talking mm -hmm. about it? Mm -hmm. You have so far been kept away from it by this mess across the channel. So well, we've been uh, kept away from it by the fact that uh, Council and Parliament have not yet dealt with these provisions in Horizon Europe. Right. Huh? That's why we have not yet engaged in exploratory conversations. They were left undone in the leading, negotiations. Yeah, leading to the negotiations. Yes, I'm well aware of the, of, of the discussions in Canada and I very much welcome them. Uh, you, you, you probably are aware, Richard, and I think just to be also very concrete, today already, and in the context of the EU-Canada summit uh, of just before the summer, Canada decided to make available, I think, $50 million uh, to support Canadian researchers in Horizon 2020 projects. So mm -hmm. already today, funding is made available, uh, which is already a qu quite a bit of a game changer. Uh, we all know that we can already work, you can, as research organizations, team up with Japanese uh, research organizations or Canadians or Australians or Koreans, and you do it. Of course, the challenge is that this is piecemeal, and the challenge for these third country organizations is that they are not funded. They need to find their funding to be part of these um, Horizon 2020 uh, consortia. And that is a, a clear limitation. And this is where the Commission has proposed uh, a provision in Horizon Europe uh, to open up the possibility of association to industrial s and industrialized third countries with a strong research basis. And then I think the Parliament is adding, I think it's a Parliament, I'm not sure whether it's a Parliament grâce à us now, I must admit, added sharing European values. Um, and, and I think that's... Which is a reference to China, more or less. The broad criteria, the yeah. broad criteria. Yeah. Uh, and on that basis, yes, the countries uh, which we are now noting uh, would be obvious uh, countries to discuss with. I think the, the process is, on the one hand, uh, these countries need to see whether they are interested, because I think the proposal of the Commission to be confirmed by the institutions is very flexible, very agile, notably on the payment modalities, so it's not GDP-based in our proposal, which makes it much more palatable. The yeah. more you participate, you more the fund. The less you participate, the less you pay into it. So fiscally, for a country, it is neutral. So you'd have, what, a, a review every few years? Yeah, on, on a regular basis. I mean, the yeah. modalities will be worked out. But th this is budgetarily, indeed, easier. It's not completely straightforward, huh? because it still means that, I don't know, if you're Australia, you decide you put some of your funding through a third party program. Huh? This is not negligible as a pol policy choice, huh? but it's palatable, because it's, uh, it makes sense from a budget point of view. So that's in our proposal. Uh, but 
so, so these countries need to see where their, their interest is, and they are, you're right, huh? we have many expressions of interest uh, across these research and innovation systems in these countries, but no official position yet. Huh? I, I hasten so to when add. can you start? Uh, as soon as uh, we, were, we will be able to, to see Parliament and Council agree the international and association provisions of Horizon Europe. When this is agreed politically, then we will have exploratory conversations. So I expect uh, late this year, early next year. Does that, is, it conditional pull, is it conditional upon there being a resolution of Brexit? This... Uh, hmm. Uh, I, I, I don't want to, to anticipate this here. I don't know. Uh, is, the, the, is the honest answer, frankly. No, uh, I, I don't understand. know about yeah. Brexit, uh, obviously. Um, and, uh, I mean, yes, this association provision is the obvious basis for our future relationship, or to discuss it at least. Whether it will be the future basis, I don't know. This is not yet in discussion. And because of that, indeed, there is... Uh, clearly um, a, a, a bit of, uh, of hesitation on the institutional side to really wrap it up. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so th th this is, um, is, is, is analytically uh, not um, okay. is, is related, but whether this will really prevent it in, in, in these time frames is for Parliament, Council and Commission to decide. I, I don't know. Okay, th well, thank you very much uh, uh, for, for submitting to and this grilling. Really we didn't co cover the missions and the partnerships, by the way, and I hope it will come in the question. Well, actually, well, why do we do that when we bring the others yes, up here? Because that is thank actually you. a relevant question. Yeah. Could I have the other panelists join me, please? Um, I'm delighted to, to, to welcome uh, as well. Uh, well. First up here is Fr Frédéric Kaplan. He's the Digital Humanities well, Chair at the École Polytechnique Ferrière de Lausanne. Uh, EPFL, better Good. known. Please come up and, and take your places. Um, uh, and project manager of Time Machine, and you I saw the video the for that, some of you, Hello, earlier you. today. Um, just right here joining me is Maria de Graça Carvalho, uh, who, alas, has an injury, uh, but uh, hopefully it's getting better. She is a member of the European Parliament, indeed, very well known to many of us because although you're a new MEP, you're also an old MEP because you were uh, a rapporteur for Horizon 2020 uh, and uh, former uh, science minister in Portugal as well. Um, uh, opening the water at the moment is uh, Tome Antecic. Uh, he is the State Secretary for Science and EU Funds of the Government of Croatia. And as those of you in Brussels know, uh, Croatia is to be the president of the uh, EU in the first half of next year. So Mr. Antecic will be quite involved in the agenda of these discussions that uh, Jean-Éric was talking about. And then beside him is Katrine Rehak Nietzsche. Uh, she's Senior Vice President of Science uh, and Research at the Bosch Stiftung, the, that's the Bosch Foundation uh, in, uh, um, uh, in Germany. So. Thank you very much, all. Um, to begin with, just a, a little more facts on the table. Uh, Tome, I wonder, could you just tell us briefly, uh, it, it, I know we're still three or four months away from the start of your presidency, but do you already have an idea as to what the priorities will be in this general field for you? Next, if we, during the president. Yeah. Well, yeah, unfortunately, it seems it's going to be a very busy, busy schedule. Uh, a year or two ago, we were hoping, uh, I was hoping it's going to be an easy life during the presidency. <laughs> Dream on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, things turned out to be very different. So, um, so in, for the first six months, we, we, we expect that, uh, well, we hope that the Horizon Europe discussions will be, uh, and the agreement will be will basically be finished, also Euroatom, yeah. and also ITER. Do you think you can get the budget, the MFF, done well, in your presidency? Well, I don't mean hoping, to express uh, it. We're hoping it will be done during, yeah. the, during the finish. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. If not, then it's, it's going to, to make you. our life more exciting, yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, the Horizon Europe is going to be obviously important. Yeah. Within particular policy areas, or is there already, like, for instance, uh, EIC entrepreneurship, and, you know, these, is, are there any particular themes that we should be watching well, actually, for? Um, well, of course, the entire package has to be done, but there's one emphasis which the, pres the Croatian president will uh, sort of focus on, 
One is, uh, well, which is of interest to, say, of Croatia and, say, EU 13 more, well, to Europe also, in general, should be, which is a, a brain circulation, mm -hmm. as opposed to this, human, uh, this huge brain drain which is coming out of uh, EU 13 countries, which is detr very detrimental to EU 13, but detrimental also to EU as a whole. And also, there will be a focus on something which is extremely relevant. I mean, we had discussions um, related to it today, uh, and concerned basically uh, the jobs of the future. Because, uh, well, as you know, because with artificial intelligence and, and all this mm -hmm. humongous progress, progress with, uh, with this uh, uh, technology 4.0, I mean, jobs within 10, 20 years will be completely different than today. Okay, so the, so brain circulation and the uh, development of the, mm -hmm. yeah. of the job future creation. looking yes. yeah, job yes. creation. Yeah. Yes. And, and, on these, yeah. and on these two points, are there any particular ideas yet that you know that you're going to be pushing? Okay. Or yeah. Well, I mean, um, on jobs of the future is a very sort of uh, hard to pinpoint so right now, but there are a lot more concrete can be done on the brain circulation, so one, so there should be several measures to uh, increase brain circulation as opposed to brain drain. One is uh, this question of remuneration, um, so equal remuneration for, for all uh, scientists. Um, the argument the being that in that the EU 13 members, their researchers, because their average national pay rates are lower, get yeah. less than those yes, in the EU 15. Yes, and as a result, they leave. Of course, if you have an ERC grantee, and he, if he gets paid, I don't know, one sum in an EU-13 country, and he could get paid five, ten times that more yeah. in an EU-15 country, of course he will leave. So will we reopen uh, the whole remuneration issue that had been... We'll see, I mean, what can be done, or, or if it can be, or if the, or if the n national laws can be adjusted or changed to take care of that. I mean, one initiative which uh, this, uh, well, Croatia is taking, is, uh, is, uh, doing right now is uh, introducing new laws for higher education science where the pay of the scientists will be flexible depending on the international projects they get. So ah, we're okay. trying to, uh, in, in a sense, uh, mm -hmm. the better you are, the more successful you are, the more pay you get. This goes against the very grain of the way the traditional academia works. In, the EU, in, in many countries of the EU 13, including Croatia. So it's something hard to push through, but it's something I think which is necessary because, well, a lot of the problems with the EU 13 countries is of their own making. So you cannot, you cannot sort of blame it. Uh, it's a lack of money, this or that. It's actually the, the, right. okay. the, the environment, the mentality, the legislative environment, which is not really conductive for uh, and to keep top researchers. Okay, all right, okay. Well, all right, that will be very interesting to watch as yeah, that yes, develops. Yes. Uh, could I come to you uh, and the parliament? Now, you are on ITRA, uh, the, the, the Committee for Industry, Re Transport, Research, and Energy. Uh, did I get that right? Yes. Not, not yeah. transport. Not transport. Uh, the T is all right. It's hard being in Brussels. Uh, um, and, but, but do you already have a feeling for what are going to be for the for that committee the most important issues to be dealing with? A little closer to you. Yeah. Uh, you it's not on. Oh. Is it on? Ah, there we go. Ah, now yeah. okay. Okay. Thanks for the invitation to be here with you and. Uh, our first priority in Eter is, of course, to finalize uh, the, the programs, the next generation of programs like Horizon to Europe in time, so uh, in, uh, uh, in an efficient way and simple, efficient programs that can start uh, without gaps with the existing programs. That is very, very important, that we don't create the additional complexity and problems that delay the, the different programs that we have in our portfolio, and we have several. Uh, so this, in a very pragmatic way, this is our uh, first priority. And this, it's simple to say, but there is a lot to be done. Uh, from budget, from uh, finalizing the negotiations and uh, uh, voting, starting things to, in order that 
the, dif the different PGs can do all the preparatory work so that 1st of January 21, everything is in place to, to Gossa, start. Could, could I, do you th is it possible that the partial general agreement could be reopened? Uh, I think that the, 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 we will try to, to get a good deal on the budget and a good deal on the topics that are still open. And I don't see myself the, any reason to reopen what is already Okay, closed. for those of you who don't but know, the, the partial general agreement is what was agreed earlier this year, which is basically what will the subject of the program yeah. be, and the money is to be decided still. Because the money is to be decided, the division of the budget for a, 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 each of the different categories, the widening, the, third, the cooperation with third parties. So there is a lot still very fundamental issues to, to be decided. And uh, I think that we should keep what is already agreed uh, and to concentrate in finalizing what is still uh, on, on the table. So this is the first priority, short-term priorities, long-term priorities. We have um, to the, the implementation of Horizon Europe. Uh, this Horizon Europe is very different in terms of implementation from Horizon 2020. Horizon 2020, and I was a rapporteur, so I feel comfortable to say that, was over prescriptive. Everything was described in the specific program, uh, in, probably in too much detail sometime when I reread the, the, what was written in the specific program, everything was there in, in a lot of details. Doesn't mean that DG research always follow very closely <laughs> everything that was there, but it was very, very prescriptive. Well, wait a minute, you were in DG research for a little <laughs> yes. while. Okay. And I draw the attention from uh, okay. several things that were there and they were a little bit. But it's true, it was too prescriptive for a program that will last for seven years and things change. Mm -hmm. This time uh, is different, this time is much uh, uh, vague, so we'll give uh, uh, much uh, free hand to this research. With your help. <laughs> <laughs> but we need uh, to follow it very closely. Okay. We need to follow from the parliament, we need to follow, of course, from the council and the stakeholders. And that is still not very clear how all this process is going to, to develop. Because in certain way, we are in the opposite uh, uh, spectrum in terms of prescription compared with Horizon 2020. So we will have a lot of work during the time to work with uh, DGRTD and the other mm -hmm. DGs on the uh, research family and the stakeholders to uh, the, on the implementation, the definition, new missions, how the missions work, not very clear yet, uh, the role of the, the governing boards, the assemblies, uh, how, we, how new missions can, can uh, appear. So all that needs to be discussed, needs to be very, uh, very close. Um, we, but uh, the uh, research and innovation is not only Horizon Europe, we have the whole policy, and uh, in terms of policy, we want to, to keep uh, things like the openness uh, uh, of the, the, res the, the principle of openness uh, very important for us, and we want to develop on that. We want to develop on the uh, research policies that is based on values, the questions of ethics in science and technology, mm -hmm. the research integrity. Mm -hmm. um, so are uh, topics that uh, are, are very important and is not uh, uh, including, of course, they are in Bend in the Horizon Europe, but they are much more general uh, than um, uh, Horizon uh, Europe. Uh, again, the, the question of openness uh, in uh, basic research in science and vis-a-vis -vis the mm -hmm. open in innovation and the open in innovation, mm -hmm. how we deal with competition with other parts of the world. So all these things need to be very well thought of and uh, very much uh, discussed. So all the questions of policy. So this in terms of research and innovation, again, on the digital world that is very touched very much uh, also with research, we have 
a lot, uh, plenty to do all the artificial intelligence uh, and all the development um, of the digital society in terms of research but in terms of implementation mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. in terms of ethics uh, very very important the transformation the way you work the jobs of the future that we just mentioned so uh, it's very it's also very important we also have the questions how to make compatible clean energy with the ambitious climate uh, goals and that mm -hmm. is again through research and technology and DITRE wants to be very much present in all this dis discussion because okay. we think that we have a very important role <coughs> through research and technology to offer the solution how to make industry compatible with the climate goals, uh, efficient industry and uh, clean energy and all the industrial policies and the new uh, industrial policies incorporating all the research, innovation, artificial intelligence, digital. So we have a lot uh, okay. to work and um, uh, we are starting with the new uh, commission, a new commissioner, uh, several commissioners because we deal with several oh, commissioners I, uh, and we are Personal, I'm very happy with the new Commissioner for Research. You are? I'm very happy. I know Maria Gabriel very well. We were colleagues at the time at the member of the European Parliament, and I'm happy with the, the fact that this is Maria Gabriel and the fact that we have education mm -hmm. uh, and research together, and finally we will have EIT together with the rest of research. So well, I hope to have the EIT and the EIC working together and to do a lot uh, towards innovation uh, in Europe. So it's a very good solution and is a very good person to implement this solution together with Jean-Henrique Paquet. So I'm really happy. Okay, all right, okay. Now, let, let me bring in uh, Catherine and, and, and also um, uh, Frédéric. The, uh, now, missions, we, we didn't talk about that, but now let's do talk about that for a moment. Uh, now, the missions, for those of you who don't know, that that's a part of the Horizon Europe in which the Commission intends to allocate a certain amount of the budget to solve big problems, mm -hmm. missions. And it relates to what you were talking about, about cross-disciplinary, yeah. cross-sectoral work. Okay. Now, Katrin, first of all, why does it matter? I mean, why is multidisciplinary work matter? I mean, there aren't professors of everything in the world, at least not in most European universities, some American universities, but uh, why, do, why does multidisciplinary work matter? And do you have any views on the missions overall? Is this the right approach? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm very glad to hear that um, there's so much effort put into co-creation and the interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary work because, of course, this is not the most easy or not the easiest road, but it's actually the one that leads to firmer solutions. So I think it's really <coughs> worth to, to put the time and the, all the um, power into it. Um, and then... We also, as a foundation, we always work at the intersections, and that relates to your question with the multidisciplinarity. I think the problems we are facing are so complex, so intermingled with each other, that we need everyone and each perspective to work on it. And so it's very important to have these cross-cutting themes, because at the intersections between the disciplines, between sectors, between whatever, you really meet different perspectives and to incorporate them in a process is extremely important. And uh, when asked for, for, for a topic, um, I think one of the most important challenges we are facing is the sustainable, sustainable development. So how do we actually get to a sustainable state on our one planet that we have? And I'm happy to hear that a lot of the research money will be invested actually in solving this problem. And Actually, I'm also glad to hear that maybe there will be opening opportunities when relating um, innovation with digital, because research and digital should be, of course, closely interlinked, but especially yeah. sustainability so. and digital are heavily interrelated. And the German advisory board on, or advisory council for global change just published a study or report on our common, it's not our common future anymore, it's our common digital future. And so the questions that arise are, if we 
uh, invest if, if we are investing money in sustainability, aren't we just tearing it down on the, with our back leg when talking about digitalization? Because we all know about the rebound effects. We know that not all the pathways we are constructing with digital futures are really sustainable. Mm -hmm. So I think it's extremely important to interlink these two trends, so sustainability and digitalization, and ask ourselves actually what kind of digital futures should we shape in order to reach sustainability. And is a mission the right way to do this? I mean, declare, I don't know, how, how, would, you define, how would you define a mission that f fits your description just there? Difficult question. Pardon me? That's a difficult question. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, that, that's the problem. I mean, uh, 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 Frederic, I mean, uh, you being from EPFL, uh, multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. it's a very broad house at that university as well. I mean, this, do you have any feeling about this reaction, on, about this planning on, of missions? Well, I think it's, it's just not just solving problem of the world, as it was fixed. I think this is, this is there's a couple of trends which are well... Uh, seen and so they can be seen as, as challenge to face. But there are also other things which are more linked with the fact that we are, uh, especially in the cultural world, with, with moving competitors and situation which is changing years of the years. Uh, of course, I mean, the thing which interests me is culture in that respect. And, and maybe to, to take a, a concrete example. Imagine we are in 2025, okay? And, and imagine I'm on the Grand Place of Bruxelles and I have a, an app which is permitting me to understand the, uh, how the, the Grand Place was constructed before, to see a, maybe a reconstruction 500 years ago, uh, to access all about all the knowledge we have on that particular place. I take the same app and I go to the museum and I point to a Bruegel painting and then I have all the information about that Bruegel painting, other paintings in Europe, etc., which are related to this. Uh, these are not apps which will be done by the city or, will, or by the museum. This will likely to be app that should work all over Europe. The big question for me is whether in 2025 that app is European or whether it's American or whether it's Chinese. If it is American, for instance, that means that all the effort which is put in some very valuable elements to protect cultural heritage become meditized by another platform. And uh, this is not really a mission, or so it's not a problem solving, but it will be maybe a problem in 10 years from now. Uh, we are sitting uh, on top of a gold mine. I mean, we have the knowledge, the multilingualism, the capacity just to, to extract data from hundreds and thousands of years of information, and we have all the skills in Europe to do that. And when I hear uh, all the discourse also today about artificial intelligence and the fact that, no, we won't be able, you know, to, to fight back against the US and China, I mean, these are very recent uh, positions in the sense that it's three years or four years, and already the Europe is, is defeated into that, and we're just going to do ethical AI, slower but safer, it's fine, I mean, I'm not against that. I just wanted to say that the, the race has not begun, because all the things, for instance, on which AI is built, is just the last two or three years of data. There's a lot, a lot of data we're sitting on, which we call the big data of the past, and, and that can be digged on to create something else, which is potentially much more powerful artificial intelligence that we're ever built, and, and that will be the situation in 2030. The question again is, if we want to have you know, this potentiality of extracting pattern, understanding society, so, understanding all the problems that we have and project ourselves to the future, will we do it because we invest into research into this, or we will let the American would, and would Chinese you do it? Would you define this as a mission? I mean, uh, it's, it's not exactly a mission in the terms it is, because the mission, I don't think the problem as they are now, trying to, but it will be, I think, a mission for the next framework program if we don't, do some, if we don't include it preemptively now. Because it's, it's, it's the moving target. I think the situation... So basically to capture European I, culture I think, I think in... To, I mean, it's, if we don't do anything on this, we're going to be in a very bad situation regarding all our effort in culture. If we don't seek that opportunity, someone else will do it. Being the Chinese, being the American, being the leaders in cultural technology. That means that we'll be in the next framework program, sitting here in Brussels, probably with, with you, hopefully, and, 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 uh, and all of us, and we'll be there, and how do we deal about the fact that we did not actually anticipate it on this? So, so I think everything is fine. I think it's great that it's co-creation. I think it, it's 
Horizon Europe is open, and so there's ways to anticipate this, but I'm insisting on the fact that the problem we identify now are not necessarily the problem that will be uh, obvious in, in 10 years, in the same okay. way that when we started age 2020, I mean, the situation mm. was not the same. Okay, because uh, as it is happens, uh, culture is one of the six clusters of, of activities that are in, going to be inside uh, Horizon Europe, uh, which is, the size of it is new. The, um, the, the, as you, jean as as you, as you are doing this strategic planning right now, mm -hmm. I imagine that these missions are the most, are probably the fuzziest part of the planning right now. They are, they are not uh, there yet, uh, and this is why mission boards uh, have started their work um, these last are boards week. That They're now in place. These yeah. are five mission boards. We, uh, I mean, we, we announced, Carlos Moedas announced them at the end of July. You, you know, I mean, Pascal Lamy or Connie Hedegaard, for example, are, are leading them on, on climate and oceans, and, and they, they have now started their work. It's really in three steps. Huh? I mean, firstly, if, I, if you allow me to say, uh, the missions under Horizon Europe are only mission areas. This is what was agreed uh, politically. And the missions, they are not about research. It's not a science mission. The mission, as it's defined, uh, and, our, and, our, and how the mission boards are now working on it, and it's quite visibly reflected also in the structure of the new commission, they are about delivering outcomes in society. Yeah? This is what the five missions are about. Huh? Making a real difference on cancer in Europe. Starting to genuinely prepare our adaptation to climate change. Getting clean or climate neutral cities. This is not research. Huh? This is about an outcome in society. It's about creating a European common good, if you want. Obviously, it's anchored in Horizon Europe. Obviously, these are challenges which are so uh, so challenging, so cross-cutting, so diverse, and so with so many trade-offs that they do require a genuinely deep research and innovation agenda. So the first phase will be for the mission boards to engage with all of you. I hope to see them in every member state, frankly, uh, to discuss with citizens, stakeholders, scientists, that they help decide on the concrete objective for the five mission areas. This is not done, huh? and this is what uh, needs to happen in, the next, in this first phase, which spans into uh, 2020. Once this objective is identified, they will come back, they will, they will certainly work quite a bit with the European Parliament, as we discussed Grasa the other day, and with ministers, they will then come back and uh, make suggestions, maybe options, maybe one recommendation, I don't yet know. And this will then be put in the strategic planning. So in the strategic planning paper, you will have the concrete objective for these mission areas. Not completely clear whether we will be ready for all five areas in 2020 or whether we will stagger that a little bit, we'll see. Once the mission objective is set, and it must be ambitious, huh? it must be targeted, it must be concrete, it must be ambitious, it must reconnect our citizens with science and public policy, I would add. That's what Carlos really wants from the missions. Uh, and um, it is also, frankly, this first phase is a, a bit of process of deliberative democracy. Huh? So it's not just to get the right objective analytically, probably we could do it in this room or my teams could do it. It's really a process where we want to engage across Europe and, and that our citizens can impact on the choices on each of these missions. Then we will work, um, and probably in, in part in parallel, on a research and innovation agenda, of course, funded in part in Horizon Europe, but in part only. My expectation is that the missions will be so uh, ambitious and so mobilizing and politically relevant that member states, foundations, uh, research organizations will, be want, will want to be part of that research and innovation agenda. And then, as the agenda delivers results, technology, solutions, then obviously is, will be a phase which is later down the road, and the timetable for each of the mission probably will be different when we move into hard implementation. And this is where there will probably be discussions on regulation, investments, traditional public policy discussions. So uh, well beyond just R&I. Well R &I. beyond yeah. Horizon Europe and R&I. And in fact, uh, the, the missions are well identified. For example, the cancer mission is obviously identified for Ma so Maria these missions, Gabriel. So it's identified ahead. also for the health commissioner. Right? The oceans mission 
is identified for Maria Gabriel. So these missions could end up being commission. these missions could end up being quite important for future regulation and policy. Uh, they will certainly. I, I very much hope that they will um, be relevant and allow us to do better policy making. Again, the missions are not solving climate adaptation okay. or the oceans. Huh? This is not possible. But we hope that they can be shaped with the help of the mission boards and parliament and ministers in such a way that they have a deep impact and get citizens into European public policy making. Okay, Grasa, I, I see you sitting up. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, so these missions actually sound a lot more important than I initially thought. And so what's the role of the parliament in this? I mean, it goes well beyond simply grants. It's still not very clear how the Parliament will be involved. I think that we'll, along the way uh, we will see how, how much we, I think that we have a, a lot of scope to be involved, but it, it will depend. Um, and uh, um, uh, I just, I have a slight worry on the, the, the missions uh, formulation and the way we are formulating the missions is that uh, we, um, in this process of co-creation and involving <coughs> and having the boards and uh, talking with stakeholders, when we do this, uh, we usually tend to involve the ones that are more present in the Brussels Beltway. Yeah, yeah. We need to go and out. we need to make sure that we uh, arrive to the ones in Croatia, in Bulgaria, in south of Spain, in Canary Islands, and, and it's not easy. Uh, so uh, sometimes a more uh, defined process, like it is the collaborative research, where you open a call and you have very clear uh, rules for participation, you need to have five or seven partners in certain areas, gives more possibility to all to participate. So we really need to be careful that the missions, in terms of participation, will not even uh, increase the gap that we already have, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. both in research but also in the participation in the formulation uh, of yeah. policies. That is. And, and I don't have a solution for that. Mm. I think that one is to travel, to go, uh, but we officials and commissioners and cannot go everywhere, so probably we need to use the new technologies to arrive to people yeah. and to, to get uh, more and more people involved, even the ones okay. that are more remote. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, yeah, yeah. can I just share, share with, with Grasa that I completely agree uh, with her and that uh, her, her concern is very much shared by the mission boards themselves uh, when I met them, by their chairs, but the members too. Uh, but there's probably one reason to be uh, hopeful is that uh, the delivery in society is not going to happen in Brussels. Uh, the delivery will happen across all national systems. And in turn, the research agenda, if we are successful, will rally resources and interest also in member states. So I think missions have the potential to be a particularly inclusive instrument, have the potential. We need to deliver that. Tommy? Just a comment. Uh, in a sense, I'm uh, and going against sort of my, my home country, but it, I think it's dangerous to, uh, um, for, for the EU as a whole to uh, try to limit the scope or the ambition of certain pro um, and programs in order for the EU 13 countries to be able to participate with it equally. I mean, as has been mentioned here, the big, big elephants in the room are America and China. And uh, we have to compete. Europe has to compete. We have to be better than them, not sort of uh, catching up to them. I mean, they are moving extremely fast. In fact, they are accelerating, especially China. We have to be better than them, and we have to be very ambitious in our missions, perhaps. And, uh, and as I said, um, as mentioned here, like policies, and I think a lot of these uh, problems, so, well, challenges, if you want to be so politically correct, in the EU 30 countries are actually um, are concerned with the ecosystem, which is not really conductive to excellence, which is not really conductive, uh, but it has to be. It, it has to be so. Yes, um, funds should be there from Horizon, but it should be actually, I think a lot of it should be conditional on both increasing funds from national, but also I think actually a lot more importantly, 
in, in fostering a much better ecosystem for legislative such labor laws and such they are very restrictive so if you do have an excellent um, initiative somewhere but but actually a lot of these things I'm saying are actually a problem also all around Europe in general so it's not just EU 13 so it's not easy for a person who has an excellent idea with excellent in initiative to form a unicorn anywhere in, in Europe EU 13 or EU 15 yeah so uh, it's very easy to do that in the States. Well, very, it's not easy to make a billion dollars or so, but it's much, much easier to do it in the States or, or, or in China. So uh, the entire ecosystem all around Europe should also be changed in parallel. So perhaps this is part of the mission, so I don't know. Are, you happy, in, are uh, you happy with the EIC plans? Yes, the EIC, you are. EIC plan seems good, but it will not work if at the same time ecosystem it does not change, which is not really part of the EIC sort of agenda, but uh, yeah. perhaps it should be. The agenda should perhaps find it. So perhaps uh, a condition to be able to get ESC grant is that the country adopts, I don't know, much, uh, much uh, more flexible labor laws if high-tech companies are concerned or something like that. Okay. And these things can form and, and, and flourish and, and foster. As it is, obviously, things are not working EU 13 or yeah. EU 15. Katrin. Yeah, so first of all, maybe uh, this uh, being better than uh, China and the US, I'm, I'm not sure about the better, maybe it should be difficult or different, so let's be different. Um, hey, no, we want to have lots well, of Trumps here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, not Trumps, but I mean... <laughs> no, 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 but on, on the other hand, um, what resonates with me is your sentence about, how did you call, um, say that, bringing science back to citizens, I think, this was what um, Paquette said, and... Um, this might be something like a capital over all the missions, like bringing back really science to people and people back to science. Because um, we just started an experiment some months ago and um, we invited randomly people and we connected them to scientists. So that basically we brought them into one room for two days together and they developed the Horizon 2020 program for us or for oh. whatever. Yeah, so maybe we could send them around. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what we could see is really that normal people who never ever had any connection to science in their lives without or except, I don't know, having aspirin or something like that, um, they really were extremely interested in the results and what's actually going on in science. So what does research mean for my life? So I think this is really a bonus that could be uh, one of the missions to bring actually people to science so they contribute yep. their knowledge and their yep. expertise. And on the other hand, bring science really to people. So bring back whatever is in the um, Horizon Europe program back to the people. Yeah, Frederic, do you want to come in on this issue of well, mission? I, I think to some extent it's a false problem because to, to mission to succeed, they're indeed based on ideas which are recognized by the people as being beyond, you know, the local calculus. I mean, I think they care for. I mean, we've been saying to some extent in, in this question about about culture and, 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 and building a machine that would uh, permit for people to actually access to their past. I mean, they want to do this. And so based on this, you have all these automatic distribution of energy, uh, um, the, the states which are not just relying on, on, on the European money, but actually found monies to do it. And it's just a question for you just to organize that growth because it's the idea itself. I mean, the go to the moon idea specific that, that is uh, for which European are caring, which create that global energy. And to some extent, Europe can just orchestrate this and making sure it does not become a national idea or even an idea of a city, but making sure actually this, this energy is organized. And so that will end up probably being the success or failure of the mission. Mm -hmm. If indeed people care, then the thing on which they care, if it's organized properly, will end up being Europe excellence. It's yes. Okay. All right. At, at this point, uh, I would like to take some co comment or question, mm -hmm. and uh, we are, we'll, if with your permission and your permission, we'll run maybe five to ten minutes late okay, yeah, yeah. before the drinks begin. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Okay. Okay with you? Uh, this presupposes that... us from the drinks. Yeah, I know. This presupposes that you want to comment and say something. So at this point, who would like to jump into... Oh, yes, I think you do. Uh, back there first. Raise your hand again so they can find... Yeah, good. Please identify yourself. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Jose Fauk. I work for TNO, uh, Dutch Public RTO. Um, I work here in Brussels. But I had a question for uh, Mr. Paquet. Uh, could you maybe respond to the comment uh, of Mr. Antici? Very if good. I say Close correctly. enough, yes. Perfect. <laughs> um, on that the EIC will not work if we don't at the same time work on the ecosystems in which the, the companies develop. Like how can we make sure that the EIC will work and that we do enough on developing the ecosystems across Europe? Mm -hmm. Would you would you like to do, do directly on connect? Oh, uh, no, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Bring yeah. it. Tommy is absolutely right. Uh, the EIC is not meant to uh, to to be the innovation policy of Europe. Uh, the EIC is, uh, I think, going to be a very powerful instrument. And, I'm, and I think across the Commission we are very excited, no to be about the accelerator, this blending instrument, which will make very, very significant funding available uh, for disruptive innovators. Um, already now, uh, as you know, we are in the pilot phase of it, and then in the full rollout in Horizon Europe. But innovation policy is much more than that. Uh, and uh, from the point of view of the EIC, what the EIC also, I think, will do beyond the funding is be a, a platform for ecosystems to interact and connect, to share these challenges, but also, and maybe more strategically, to convey the message to our innovators that they are not confined to one ecosystem. Well, however great it is, but they should move across Europe and deploy uh, their innovation across Europe. I guess we're doing remarkably well in Europe on innovation. And we are the best in the world as concerns the creation of startups. We create more startups in Europe than in the United States. Okay? So that's not the problem. We, are, we have invested across all member states, around universities, around industry, in rather remarkable, agile, often well-funded innovation ecosystems. The challenge is really the scaling up, and this requires indeed a better connection to science and research and uh, a number of instruments and legislation to allow that our companies grow fast and in Europe. And it's a real deep challenge, huh? there's no doubt about that. And uh, for the next cycle it will remain on the agenda. The EIC is, a, I think, very, very, very relevant and, okay. and, and strong contribution to that. Thank you. Uh, over there. Uh, Jan van den Biese, I'm advising industry in the Excel joint undertaking. And my question is about partnerships. Uh, Richard, you promised that you would address that topic. My specific question is the timing thereof. Mm -hmm. We are still awaiting the open uh, public consultation on the institutionalized partnerships. So apparently there is a delay. Would that possibly imply that also the Commission's proposals will be delayed and it will not be even up to the Croatian presidency? but to the next one to deal with them. That Germans be should be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but not we. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, of course uh, also Parliament uh, will have to have a look at uh, the yeah. proposals. Yeah. You know what, the, work on, you the work on partnerships is in full, full swing, uh, in particular with member states, but also with uh, all industry players across the spectrum of the existing institutional partnerships and a number of uh, future partnerships. I mean, in fact, we have kicked off on the 30th of July the consultation on the inception impact assessment. It's out, huh? Yeah, so yeah, it has now started. The, the yeah, yeah, I mean, this so is we a first step. To that one? This is a first step. Uh, now uh, we will, uh, in the coming weeks, launch the, the broader consultation, which then feeds uh, your views and, and your analysis into the preparation of the impact assessment. Uh, so, so no, no, we are we on track. We are on track uh, on the timetable. I think it will be it will not be a one size fits all. Huh? We will do it partnership by partnership as we we, we are ready. Uh, the first step is that this makes sense in the broader strategic planning context. Everything is connected. Huh? Well, I, I, and, and the, partners, the institutional partnerships with all the others and with the rest of the research. And so I think we need the full picture. Member states want the full picture, and so do we, uh, before we make the proposals. But that's the planning which was the initial one, so no, no worries to be had there. Most of the institutional partnerships of today, they run well into 21, 22, and 23. But it's equally true that for additional new funding, uh, we will need to be ready uh, uh, early on, and that's our ambition. 
On the partnerships, there's one specific dimension which also will require a little bit of effort across uh, the communities, is to link the partnerships with one another. That's one of the main uh, new uh, dimensions, uh, but the partnerships are already discussing it today amongst themselves, which I welcome, and I think this will be a big part of the work too. For, for those, no of, you, for for, for those of you who don't follow it that closely, yeah. the partnerships are the one of the principal instruments by which industry yeah. and public yeah, and private cooperation have many happen. Many different forms. It can be uh, extremely right. integrated with a with a structure, which then implements funding under EU instruments. That's the case of Excel in microelectronics. You have uh, the Clean Sky Partnership, the uh, Air Traffic Management CESAR Partnership. We have uh, a partnership on the bioeconomy. We have partnerships in health. I mean, you know the existing ones. They are part of the discussion to see in how far we renovate them, modernize them, increase their scope, their impact. And there are several others which, uh, which industry or member states or commission services are exploring as additional possibilities for this very integrated approach. But then you all have also other more flexible forms of partnership, which we co call co-funding between industry or member states and EU programs, but without a, a full institutional structure, or then simply co-program partnerships where everybody tries to be a bit smarter and rolls out its own research effort in a systematic, uh, synergetic way across Europe. Yeah. So these are various forms and that they are all listed um, uh, comprehensively as we stand today in the consultation document of strategic planning. Are we on track? Okay, all right. Uh, there's a question right there. Yes, my name is Helmut Duwe. I worked for three decades for a large research establishment mm -hmm. and today I see the young scientists coming. Uh, the wife has got a baby and they come at work and are sleepy. So uh, my question is uh, now, um, in 2004 I think the general director of research issued um, the charter or the char charter for researchers, yep. uh, could it be that it's time to update that char charter mm -hmm. to have, let's say, an, a good employment, attractive workplaces for young scientists in Europe? Yeah, I, I, thank you. Uh, this uh, by the way, others, up, others of you who might want to come in. And I think this is yeah. clearly also yeah. something, yes, of interest yeah. for the other, other yeah. institutions. Uh, well, I don't think that the Charter in isolation will do that, but you're very right. This can really provide a good direction. And I think our, our, our labor policies, the policy on, on work-life balance, I mean, these are all elements of labor and social policy which have much changed over the last 15 years, and also the way younger generations engage in a profession has much changed. Some of that is reflected, uh, these challenges and new modalities and new cultures are in fact quite well reflected in the Marie Skłodowska Curie proposal on the Horizon Europe, which has been quite well modernized, taking these uh, aspects into account. And that's work uh, happening in other parts of the Commission than my own team, so I can underline it, I think. Um, but yes, it's an interesting idea. Um, I, I would certainly be open um, uh, to look into it. But that's, I think, more also a choice for maybe commissioners. Frederic, is everybody too tired at EPFL to work? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no, this issue, I mean, about the researcher, the, 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 the career path and the, and the, and the um, conditions. Yes, please. Yeah. This is also a question very much related with the member states. And... Uh, uh, questions of budget and uh, the budget that each member state devotes to uh, research, to the research organizations, to, to the universities and the, the private investment of each country because uh, we have in the country that I know well, Portugal, we have uh, similar kind of uh, problems of a, a very precarious uh, research career. Uh, because we need to increase more the investment and give more autonomy to the institutions to recruit and to give better conditions. So it will help to have a charter, but we need to do a lot of things that are not easy uh, in, in our member states to create a better condition for researchers and for younger researchers. Okay, yes, there's a question here. And Hi, my name is Karin Cipido. I chair the Research Policy Council 
University of Leuven, mm -hmm. and I'm also currently chairing the Scientific Panel for Health under Horizon 2020. Okay. My question is about the stakeholder involvement that Mrs. Carvalho brought up. It's very important to bring the stakeholders into the process, the policy making and the execution, obviously. You have organized, and I ask my question also to you, Monsieur Paquet, you have organized consultations that are very widely. But what they do is they feed the different stakeholders individually into the process. And I think it would be very fruitful and enriching to have a mechanism where stakeholders come together yeah. and discuss among them together mm -hmm. towards input. Yeah. So what do you have in mind to have as kind of panels, advisory groups? Because the word that came during the discussion with the guild of the universities that advisory panels are maybe not very efficient. But here you have a collection okay. of different organizations and stakeholders, and we think it's very important to be together. So how do you think to organize okay. that type of consultation? Before you answer that, let's just take one last question there, and we'll combine these two, okay? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. go ahead. I don't know, it's on. Merop Panel from the European Commission, uh, International Cooperation. I believe that one of the challenges, and I saw very little advocating here, it's the challenge of climate change, and it's a real challenge. For the humanity, all the discussions for climate change, it's not a luxury. It's, it's a real threat. I was reading the scientific literature from very um, high scientists, and the, thing, uh, the issue is dramatic. We have the Green Deal in Europe, together with the mission objectives, that offer us a huge opportunity mm -hmm. in Europe to do different and to do better. And the advice that I have in all these debates for the Commission, with the new Commission, the Parliament, use this tool to re-engineer Europe get rid of this hypocrisy and all this thing and go to the work really in regions how we decarbonize europe mm -hmm. how we uh, increase the digital the circular economy with an, a circular economy perspective because we have okay all this iphone all these things need raw materials that we don't have in europe we are looking for raw materials and the only way to get them and to re-industrialize europe is to use a, re a circular economy okay and so uh, and uh, and develop because apart from spotify that re-engineer sweden the world for music, all the other Google, all the other Amazon, all the other things, all of this, uh, it is coming from US. And how okay. Europe could play geopolitically a role and go for peacemaking, because we have increase of radicalization in the whole world, and there is Understood. no logic. No, Understood, okay. yes. Yeah. So the yeah. emphasis how on, Europe on climate could yeah. uh, play a role that is powerful okay. and digitally, and at the same time that we can play a catalyst role geopolitically, but we need to be strong. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, so these last two points. Mm -hmm. Any comments on these? Yeah. I mean... Uh, Catherine, come to you for a moment. No, Cli yeah. Climate. Yeah, climate, well... Mm. As I said, you spend money on this. <laughs> you spend yeah. money on the this Bosch Stiftung does. Yeah. We spend money on uh, really combining different trends. As I said, digitalization. Of course, we have to th keep in mind where do the resources come from when we have our nice iPad or whatever. But the answers cannot be easy, and so it's very important actually, yeah, to bring together people, and not only by consultation, but also in real. But that's a real challenge. That is already a challenge for cities. So, and we are talking here Europe, so this is really a matter of organization, a matter of whom to choose and how to bring back the results because it's not possible that from Brussels this is be done. To okay, and, so and actually, I mean, okay. go ahead. I mean, climate, yes, but the, the thing is, I would not be, okay, not co quite so pessimistic about climate because a lot of technologies 
to solve it or, or to address it to a very large extent actually exists already today. I mean, you have this solar and wind, which can replace coal, um, coal stations all around the world. There's actually a lot of excellent, in fact, already um, economically uh, um, competitive uh, um, battery storage systems. So a lot of energy production can really switch away from coal very okay. quickly. Okay. There's electric cars, for example. That, that's also very quickly now scaling up. So a lot of the CO2 it actually economically will go. So things are dramatic, but I do have faith to my To my astonishment, yes. when I was in the U.S. this summer and rented a car, yes. they gave me a hybrid. I didn't even know they made them in the U.S., but anyway. Uh, uh, Jean-Noric, would you care to respond to the uh, question about the yes, stakeholders? Yes, and yes, then we close, yes. okay? Yes, I mean, just to say that, uh, indeed, climate and the Green Deal is at the heart, really at the heart of the political guidelines of President-elect Ursula von der Leyen. So the organization of the college, her ambition, alongside digital and alongside geopolitics, is really organizing the work of the institution in the next cycle. So this is uh, well, uh, well understood and well identified. And uh, across um, uh, commission services already at this stage, without anticipating the work of the college of future commissioners, this is the, the priority. And we are working also in research and innovation. Uh, to provide um, uh, additional um, solutions, uh, as illustrated just now. On working groups, advisory council, expert groups, uh, indeed we are now in a phase uh, of uh, strategic planning where, uh, if you want, the leap of faith we are making is that uh, there is space uh, to engage on a completely broad and transparent basis with everyone at the same time. This is a phase today, and this is what will happen at the uh, Research and Innovation Days concretely, uh, where uh, I would very much expect that both in these sessions, but also then engaging with us, you will not come individually. I hope you will come in groups of uh, key players, so that indeed the cross-cutting uh, discussion can take place whether in the phase of implementation later next year or, 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 or down the road we, we move back to the more traditional uh, mode of engaging with experts is open. We haven't decided that. Uh, and uh, this is, agree I, I'm agreed with you that this is a, a relevant way of working, uh, but I think there is a lot of uh, need to experiment also other ways of working. Uh, including to ensure that all stakeholders have access. And that's the phase now. So we, we, we'll see down the road. But thank you very much for your comment. Okay. Well, thank you very much to our panel. Thank you to you for st staying with us. And thank you for those online who uh, can now switch off. Uh, so uh, for you those here, the drinks are in that direction. Uh, I hope you have a chance to meet each other and talk more. Thank you very much. <laughs>